can I say welcome and, and thank you for, for joining this session. Um, it's, it, this is a subject close to my heart. And I was traveling just before the first lockdown. I was traveling on the tube in London. And who got onto the same carriage with his entourage but Boris, Boris Johnson. And what he did, he went round everybody in the carriage and he, he greeted them and he said hello and he had a bit of chat and a bit of banter with people. Some people were giving him a bit of hassle, but he took it all in good measure. And then we arrived in the station where he had to get off. And what I witnessed, <laughs> I still had to pinch myself because the first thing he did, he pulled out his shirt and then he ruffled his hair and he put his tie over to one side slightly. And he walked out to greet the press. Now that's going against everything people will talk about in politics. But here's a man who has developed this personal brand that is recognized the world over. And some say he acts like a buffoon, but it takes a very smart person to act the idiot. And that's what he plays on. He's developed this brand which makes him stand out from all of the rest of the politicians. And it's interesting, I do believe that that had a big part in getting him elected. Um, whether you believe in his policies or not, or whether you can believe in his policies or not, is maybe the real question. He, he got himself elected on personality, on his personal brand, and he projects it so, so strongly and has done this throughout his entire career. And that's the importance of this. You see, a personal brand is absolutely no different to the brand of a product. So if you are trying to project yourself and you're trying to get out there into the marketplace, you can learn from people like him. You can learn from some of the stars that you see on the screen or in social media, because what they do, they brand themselves very strongly and then they push that brand. Is that brand reality? Sometimes it's not. So when you're thinking about this, do take it seriously, because you will need to be thinking about what is it that I am trying to project to the outside world? Whenever you walk through the door, what perceptions are you giving off? When people see you on social media, what do they really think? So that's what I mean by personal brand. So look upon it, look upon yourself as a product that you're trying to sell. And there are things that you need to consider right from the start. <clears throat> so there may be, a, if you may want to take notes during this, because I think it is that important. And you will definitely need your phones later on during the session, because you'll be looking something up in Google for me. So the first thing to think about is, who am I trying to sell to? In other words, what is your career path you have chosen? because that will determine and have a big influence on how you project your brand. For example, if you're going into accountancy, you have to look safe. So you have to think, right, what will make me look like a safe brand? Because I don't want to be taking my books to an accountant who does it off the cuff. I need somebody who is dependable and it will give me the correct advice. So I'm talking about, so I need to see safety. Now it doesn't mean you have to be in a suit, shirt and tie or anything like that. It just means you have to look safe. If you are in the creative industries, I know somebody is doing um, graphic art and graphic design, you have to look creative. I mean, if you don't look creative, people who are going to employ you aren't going to take you that seriously. If you're in medicine, what, does that look like? And, and I could go on. So you need to, first of all, decide what type of brand do I need to sell in the career path that I am choosing? So that is the first thing. The second thing is just like any product, whenever they design a product and they're trying to brand it, the first question they always ask, if that was a human being walking through the door, what would his personality be? That's the first thing that they always do with the product. They give it a personality. You already have that. 
But what you need to do is to take an element of your personality. What element of your personality are you really going to project? Is it enthusiasm? Is it excitement? Is it calm? What is that personality trait that you're going to project? The third one is how you're going to package it. In other words, how you're going to dress it, how you're going to have your hair, how you're going to wear the glasses. If you look at an awful lot of people uh, on TV at the minute, watch that show, for example, The Repair Shop. There's a guy in that, and unfortunately I can't remember his name, but he always wears a flat cap and big glasses. Is that by accident? No, that is his brand. Billy, that is Jay. Who is it? Jay. Jay. That's the very, he's dyslexic and very creative as well, by the way. Yeah. And Jay, what he does, that's his packaging. That is how he projects himself to the outside world. And don't ever, ever let anybody tell you that your appearance doesn't matter. That is nonsense. Because subconsciously, everybody judges other people by their physical appearance. It's unfortunate, but true. It's not something that I like. I mean, I am a great believer, you know, in theory, don't judge a book by its cover. But unfortunately, the majority of us do judge the book by the cover. And then finally, how do you market your brand? How do you get it out there? How do you let people know about you? How do you market your brand? In this, at this stage of your careers, I would suggest something I su suggested in one of the sessions I did yesterday, you must learn to give good presentations. Because if you can present well, you reach a huge number of people. But you must be able to present well. Anyway, one thing is the cornerstone of your brand. And that is your reputation. Your reputation is your legend. And this is what I want people to think about now. You need to be starting at this stage in your life to build your legend. Now, I have worked literally all over the world. And I had a very simple rule. Because I actually witnessed this. I was at, speaking at this massive conference. And there was this eminent sports star was speaking as well. And at the end of the evening, he was getting more and more sozzled. He was just drinking, drinking, drinking till he could barely stand straight. And then as the night wore on, his behavior became totally erratic. And he started going around the tables and asking all the women if they'd go to bed with him. Of course, everybody refuses. And at three o'clock in the morning, apparently, because I didn't witness, but at three o'clock in the morning, this man, who was absolutely sozzled, got into his car and drove home. He will never, ever be used as a speaker for that organization again. He destroyed his reputation. And that has gone right across, uh, cast a cloud right over his speaking engagements. His agents are really struggling now to get him work. You need to build this reputation and protect it like gold. I had always a rule because maybe it's a bit of insecurity on my part, at half past 10 at night after a conference, no matter what, I left and went back to my hotel room. So therefore, I would never get into trouble like that. You guard your reputation and you build your legend. Part of it is built through your clothes, your gestures, your words and actions. Those are the things you build your legends on. You notice, I didn't say work, because some of the finest teachers and lecturers, and ever I was teaching myself, there was one man I knew, and he was absolutely brilliant as a mass teacher. He was a legend, but he never, ever got promoted because he didn't build his brand strongly enough. And even though he was a fantastic teacher, he was overlooked at every promotion prospect. 
And as I said, please don't let anybody tell you that your payments doesn't matter. It's just one of those things. Now, the key element here that you need to be thinking about is your personality. Now, what I would honestly suggest at this stage in your careers is go online and do what's called the big five personality test. I would have done it this morning, but it takes too long. So when we're finished here today, at some stage, do the big five personality test. It's the most recognized personality test um, in the world today, and it's used literally all over the world. And then when you have that, and you have an idea of what your personality is, find one characteristic and build your entire brand upon that. Something unique, something that sets you apart from the rest. Now that could be anything, it could be generosity, it could be honesty, it could be creativity, it could be calmness, it could be decisive, it can be anything you want it to be. But it has to be part of your personality, your real personality. It is not something, because the one thing you don't want to do is try to be something that you're not. Because people will always spot the phony. And you know who are the best at spotting the phony? Children, I have discovered over the years. Right? So, <coughs> excuse me, choose a characteristic or a trait that you have naturally. And use that. Um, I always remember the, the former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, his, what he built his entire reputation upon was integrity and honesty. Now, that is difficult for a politician, but to an extent, until the Iraq war came along, that was very successful for him. And then, of course, it collapsed in on him. And one last thing in this one before we get into the nitty gritty, is if somebody attacks you publicly, say on Instagram or Facebook or whatever the other media is that you use, somebody attacks you publicly, don't react. Because if you react, you're showing that you're insecure. It's that reaction that could damage you more than what's actually been said about you. Now, there is a time and a place to defend yourself, but I don't think social media is the place for that. It's like one night I was speaking at this conference and it was a, a group of professors from all around the world. And there were some very, very big names speaking. And I was the alone. And I got up to speak and I hadn't even, I said, good evening. That's all I said. I hadn't uttered another word. And this professor stood up and he went, and he was, as if so, so, you are an absolute disgrace. You're not intelligent enough to be here. That's what he said. And he was completely and utterly out of it and drunk. Now, my natural instinct, I could feel the red mist rising. And all I wanted to do was go down and tear the head off him. But I knew I couldn't do that. And I knew I couldn't react to this because if I was going to react to this publicly, they would think and would take his side. So I said to the rest of the audience, I just opened, opened it up and I said, what do the rest of you think of that comment? And they absolutely tore into him. And the chair, who was this eminent professor from Harvard, stood up and he says, sir, you're an absolute disgrace. You do not belong in this room please leave and he was escorted out of the business if i had reacted to that the sympathy would have been with him so don't react okay another thing to be very 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 careful of please don't be an open book don't tell everything there's this thing oh is, aren't they a lovely, honest person? Aren't they a lovely, open person? And I hear this all the time. Well, oh, they're great people. And that's good to an extent. But if you're an open book, it ends up making you look foolish. Strange but true. It just does. So what you're safer doing 
is keeping your attentions and your opinions to yourself, especially at this stage in your career. Keep your intentions and your opinions to yourself. Because here's the thing, if you are in a department or a, an organization where the person above you might be only a year or two older than you, and they see you coming along and you've all these strong opinions, they're going to feel threatened. Guess what they're going to do? They're really going to hammer down on you and hold you back. So never outshine your boss. It's an old saying, but it's a very, very true saying. Never, ever outshine your boss. What you want to do is look calm and friendly and enthusiastic because those are the things that make people believe in you. If you're calm, approachable and friendly, and if you're enthusiastic about something, people start to believe in you as a person. However, if you use extravagant words and gestures, that raises suspicion. <coughs> now, we're going to do an exercise, and this is a really, really important one. And this is to work out before we actually start talking about the actual brand and how to build this brand, I mean, the package inside of it. What I need you to do is to really work out who you are. Now, the best way of doing this is an exercise called strengths and weaknesses. Now, I'm sure everybody has done this. I've done this in courses in the past, and I find it a pointless exercise. This one, the way we're going to do it, is slightly different. Oh, by the way, I see something there. There's also MBTI test, 16 types for assessing personalities. I must have a look at that later on. And the Daniel Lettle one uh, is, is a really good one, but I'll definitely, definitely, Angelina, I think it is, will have a look at that. Thank you so much for that. You always learn something. It's brilliant. Um, the strengths and weaknesses we're going to do differently. So if you have a piece of paper or even on a tablet or on your phone, we're going to take a little bit of time and do this. This is why this is so important. <coughs> and as I say, we're going to do it differently from you've ever done it before. First of all, would you write down as many of your strengths as you can possibly think about? While you're doing that, I want to get a glass of water. So write down as many of your strengths as you could possibly think about. So things like, are you creative? Would you say you are dependable? Are you loyal? Would you have an empathetic nature? In other words, do you care about people? Other ones, would you be an extrovert? Are you outgoing? Or would you be an introvert? Because being an introvert can also be a strength. It's, it's a really strange one, that. Because the majority of the population are introverts, but we pretend to be extroverts. Strange one, that. Um, I, I remember listening to that fabulous architect who, who designed the Gherkin in London. I can't remember his name, but it will come back to me. But he said, I appear to be an extrovert. He says, actually, I'm an introvert. He says, I put on this show when I'm out and about. And he says, whenever I go home, there's nothing I like as much as being at home on my own and surrounded by my things. So are you an extra extrovert? Are you an introvert? 
would you say you are a good safe pair of hands? Are you impulsive? I don't know if you'd see that as a strength or a weakness. I let you decide that. Are you impulsive? Do you make plans? Do you set goals? In terms of weaknesses, do you lack confidence? A big one that we covered yesterday, are you resilient? So if you're resilient, that is a strength. If your resilience is in question, that is a weakness. Are you romantic? I thought I'd throw that one in. Or not romantic. These both you can put these in strength and weaknesses. Uh, did I say creative? Yes, I did. Are you disciplined? Are you fit or unfit? Are you passionate? In other words, are you enthusiastic? A good thing to do when you decide to look up those personality tests, I see this exercise, I would take a lot of time doing this. And when you look at that personality test, I, I find it difficult to accept you can put people in boxes. Um, so what I do whenever I'm doing the personality test with people, I don't actually do the test with them. What I do, I go through the personality types and get them to choose the characteristics that relate to them. Because you find that people's personality can be spread across all the personality types. So all I'm interested in are what are the characteristics. And when you look at the characteristics, then what you can do, you say, well, that characteristic is a strength of mine or a weakness of mine. And you'll find that you'll end up with a really good list of strengths and weaknesses on based upon personality types, which then makes it very easy to develop your brand. Now, I'm going to give you a list of things here I want you definitely, definitely to put into your strengths and weaknesses. <coughs> I was working with this sports team many years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. My voice wasn't like this, by the way, not like this all the time. Two days ago, I had no voice. So it's slowly coming back. Um, I was working with a sports team a few years ago. And we were losing the match. And the playmaker on the pitch, this guy, immensely talented individual, took himself out of the game and he went to the goal line and he looked all around the pitch. He went on and he talked to one of the defenders. He talked to the midfielder. He talked to somebody up forward. Everybody changed their position. And we won the match easily. And I had witnessed something really special there that day. I had witnessed a strategic thinker, somebody who can see the big picture. Strategic thinkers, according to every piece of research that I have read, only 2% of the world's population can actually think strategically. It is a talent, it is a gift that some people have. And it's based upon primitive society, because in primitive society, you don't want everybody to be strategic because everybody's then everybody's jostling for position. What you wanted is one person to think spring, summer, autumn, winter, and they plan the year ahead. And that's what a strategic thinker is. They're the people who can think long term. They are visionaries. 
I mean, Napoleon could stand on the hill of a battle and make sense of the chaos and decide what to do. So the question I'm asking you, and this is where you have to be honest, are you a strategic thinker? If you are strategic, would you put it as a strength and underline it? If you're like me and you're not strategic, would you put it as a weakness and circle it? Now, the reason I say this is, you have to be honest about this, is because this can have a huge impact on the direction that you take your career in. Number two, tactical. A tactical thinker may not see the vision, but once they are told what that vision is, they will tell you how to get there. They're the planners. They're the detailed people. They will put in the steps that are required to reach that goal. So tactical people, endless number of tactical people, hugely important way to be able to think. They're detailed people. Now, if you are tactical, would you write it as a strength and underline it? If you're not tactical, would you put it as a weakness and circle it? So there's two. Third one, instinctive. Are you an instinctive person? Do you plan, do you just play things off the seat of your pants? I'd be very much like this. I'm not good at making plans. I'm dyslexic, so my brain doesn't think you know, logically. My brain thinks differently. But instinctive people are the ones who think outside the box. They're fantastic in organizations because they look at things differently. They're great in the creative industries because they do think of things differently. So if you are instinctive, would you put it as a strength and underline it? If you're not instinctive, would you put it as a weakness and circle it? And by the way, you can be all of these. Next one, practical. The practical people are exactly what they say. These are the people who can get the job done. So if you're practical, put it as a strength and underline it. If you're not practical, would you put it as a weakness and circle it? And the last one on this, bonder. What a bonder is, these are the people who are brilliant with other people. They're good motivators. They're good at empathy. They're good at understanding other people. And it's amazing the number of leaders that I've met over the years who are not good bonders, but I'll explain how they actually cope with that. So if you're a good bonder, would you put it as a strength and underline it? If you're not good with people, in other words, you're not a good bonder, would you put it as a weakness and circle it? <coughs> now, as I said, take your time and, and do spend time on this because it's so powerful. Because what we're going to do now is a three-step process. Once you have all of your strengths and weaknesses done, and every course that I've been on, they've always said, take your weaknesses and turn them into strengths. Now, one of my weaknesses is detail. I'm very poor at detail. But my strength is crazy. And whenever I was lecturing, I came up with the ideas for the assignments. And I worked with another lecturer who never had an idea in her life, but was brilliant with detail. Together, we won national awards, whereas if I'd been doing that on my own, I would have lost my job. So sometimes it's not to your benefit to try to turn some weaknesses into strengths because they can damage what you're good at. So this is why we step, start a three-step process. Step number one. Would you underline your core strengths? Now, you already have some of these underlined because I've got, if you were strategic, I've got you to underline it. So go through your strengths and underline your core strengths. Now, you may have only one or two. You may have 30. I don't care as long as you know what your core strengths. 
These are the strengths that define you as a person and will be the things that you will build your brand upon. By the way, this is what they do um, in, you know, for commercial products. Volvo, for example, whenever they were doing their strengths, one of their strengths was safety. So what did they build the brand upon? Safety. And yet a Renault, which is not renowned for safety, is actually safer than a Volvo or was safer than a Volvo. So you choose one of these traits and other people may have them, but you choose one of these and they're going to be what you build your brand upon. So you write down your core strengths. And what I would always do is lift those out and put those in a separate sheet somewhere. Step number two, you circle your core weaknesses. These are the weaknesses you cannot change. I mean, for example, if you have strategic circled, I can teach you strategy all day, but it cannot make you a strategic thinker. Detail and me just don't mix. So circle your core weaknesses. These are the things that you are not going to attempt to change. Now, what you have done here is something profound. We did this exact exercise with a very famous football manager and he swears that his success came down to this here because he now knew what he was really good at he knew what he was not so good at so therefore what he did he brought in the people to compliment him to do the things he couldn't do that's what all successful people do they work on their strengths and they work with people who can complement them, who can do the things they can't do. Now, I know in the initial stages of your career, that may not be always possible, but that is something you need to be thinking of in the long term. I need to have people to, who can collaborate with me. And that's what teamwork's all about. This is why I get so frustrated whenever I hear there's no I in team, which is absolute nonsense. A team is made up of individuals, and you're only as strong as your weakest individual. So therefore, you have to make every individual as strong as possible and get them to work collaboratively. That's what teamwork's all about. It's not about liking the person beside you. It's working together is important. Now, that is massive. Okay, that is massive. Third and final step, you have a series of weaknesses that you have encircled. Those are the ones you're going to turn into strengths. And what I would always suggest that you do is that you prioritize those. And here's something else. When you're trying to change something, do it over six weeks. The average person can only see six weeks ahead, which is why I always question the whole thing of goal setting. Um, if you look at Olympic athletes, for example, they're trained in six week cycles. If you look at how the Romans trained their legions to train them in six week cycles. If you look at the great authors, what did they do? They worked in six week cycles. Why? That's the way the brain works best. So when you're trying to change something, do six weeks, review it, change it, do it for another six weeks. Now I know I'm rushing these things and I'm just so aware of the time is flying by, but there's just so much I need to get through, out to you here today. That's one exercise. Take your time. Please do that. You will find it unbelievably um, advantageous to you. And carry that throughout. As long as you know what your core weaknesses are and your core strengths are, you definitely can develop a really strong brand. 
Now, down to the practical bit. Uh, how do you package this here? You know, how do you do this? Um, I mean, I'm always asked, well, you, you speak in public, and I work with a lot of conservative organizations. And they say, well, why did you get your hand tattooed? Why, you've got to why did you show your tattoo? Surely that's against everything that is. The reason is, I'm at a stage in my career that I can do it. I'm well known enough so I can do it. I have a little bit of power and influence so I can do it. Could I have done this 30 years ago? Absolutely not. But I did this deliberately, so whenever I go into some companies, how it was actually put to me, this guy's different, slightly dangerous, which is exactly what I wanted to get out to these conservative organizations to get them to start to think outside the box. So that's what I mean. How do you package this here? The starting point, and this is where you're going to need your phones. The starting point with any brand is always color. Get the color right, and then everything else starts to fit into place. Now, just to give you a bit of background on this here, um, people say, well, how do you know all about this? I was the first male image consultant in 1996. And a male, and what I had to do was advise people how to dress and what to wear. And I won the World Championship, and this is not me blowing my trumpet, by the way, I'm just telling you the facts. I won the, the World Championship as a makeup artist and as a stylist way back in, I think it was 2004, 2005. So we know a little bit about this, and I've dressed and put uh, clothes on some of the most famous individuals in the world, including a group of supermodels at one stage. So we know a little bit about it. And the first thing is always color. Now there's two reasons for this. Number one, color has a psychological profile. Now up until recently, it was a bit of a pseudoscience. But now there's been more and more studies done on it, thankfully, because the commercial organizations all knew this, like Coca-Cola. Red, for example, always attracts the eye because it means blood and it means danger. So we are always drawing, drawn to the color red. Ferrari, why do they use red? Because that's what draws the eye. Coca-Cola in the early stages would have stacked their tins up in a supermarket, so whenever you come around with your trolley, bang, you're hit with this bank of red. You can't ignore it. Politicians have used red for years in their ties and their jackets, the female ones, to say par, dangerous, aggressive. I'm in charge here. Blue, on the other hand, is the complete opposite. Blue says safe and dependable, cool and calculating, which is why the United Nations wear blue hamlets and blue berries. Pink has been used in politics from around about 1997, um, because up until then, politicians always wore the dark suit, usually navy, and the white shirt. And if you're a Labour, you wore a red tie. If you're a Conservative, you wore a blue tie. But navy and white together, you, the, the navy says par, the white says clinical, and when you put the two together, it says stand away, keep away, stand off. It. So now, if you look at a lot of the politicians, they'll wear a pale blue shirt or a pale pink shirt. Why do I wear a pink shirt? Well, on screen, pink, for some reason, just works with the skin tone really, really well. Brown, I always say to people, if you're going for an interview, never wear browns or greens. They're lovely, earthy colors. They make you look very approachable and really friendly, but they don't give you authority. So keep your browns and your greens for casual days, when you're with friends. And we could go through all the color range. That's something that everybody here can look up. I mean, it's not, not hard to do. So that's the first thing. Every color has a psychological pro profile. And by the way, in certain col cultures, different colors mean certain different things. So be careful if you're going abroad, always check what's, 
what's the cultural implications of red, for example, in China? What's the cultural implication of black in certain countries? However, on a personal level, the color you wear closest to your face will either make you look ill, older, drawn, and will kill your eye color, so now you look shifty as well. The correct color closest to your face makes you look better, makes you look younger, makes your skin shine and shows off the eyes. It is the number one thing whenever you're choosing any garment. Before you think about size, before you think about style, the number one thing is always color. Whenever I dress people, the first thing I do when I go into a store, look at colors. What are the colors that are going to suit this individual? And then what I do, I kept them out, but it's always color first. So I'm going to give you six types. See if you fit into any one of these. Number one is what's called deep. Now, deep people are really easy to spot because they have dark hair and dark eyes. Dark hair, dark brown eyes. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. Now their skin may be black or their skin may be that Irish white. But as long as they've got dark hair and dark eyes, they're what's called deep. And deep people only suit strong colors. It makes sense. Because if I was to put this pink shirt on a guy with dark hair and dark eyes, this pink shirt is just going to look, make him look washed out. Why? Because it's not strong enough. He suits bright pink he suits pure white he suits black put black on me i look like a corpse so if you're deep go on to google and look up color palettes spring summer color palettes or sorry deep spring summer color palettes for 2022 this is 21 or 22 i can't remember right but look that up and it'll show you the colors you actually suit at this moment in time. The next one is the exact opposite of this. These are people who have got light colored hair and bright eyes. Blonde would fall into this here. So if you're naturally blonde or if you had red hair, which is now gone gray, you're what's called a light. And what light people do, they suit light colors and bright colors. In other words, their hair is light, so they suit light colors. They suit bright colors because their eyes are bright. So if you're going for a blue, you go for a light blue, like a sky blue, or you go for a true blue, but nothing in between. So it's all as light and bright with lights. The next ones are really easy to spot. They're warms, the redheads, fabulous coloring. And there are two types of redhead, believe it or not. There's that really bright, what some people will call ginger, and then it goes right through to a sandy red. And there, they are two distinct uh, color palettes. But the bottom line is you suit earthy colors. You suit the browns and the greens and the salmons and the peaches and the terracottas and the rusts. But put a pink like this on you and you look awful. It just drains you. You do not suit pure white, for example, and you most definitely do not suit black. So what can you wear for job interviews? Things like teal. Teal for you just works. For a guy, if he's going and he has to wear a jacket or a suit, I would always say go for grey and then put in a, a ivory shirt and then get a rusty coloured tie. It just looks brilliant. The next group are cools. And these are people with mid-brown hair who tan easily. It's that simple. Mid-brown hair, some people would call it mousy. Mid-brown hair and who tan easily. And these people suit cool colors. And the one color they should never have in the top half of their body is black. It just drains them. Your black is navy. I would be cool, which is why the gray beard, which is very cool, actually sits well on the face. Why? Because it's a cool color. If that was a red beard, it just wouldn't work. So cool suit the blues, the turquoises, the aquas, marines. They suit pink, 
and navy. So those sorts of shades that you really suit. Next one is clear. And I know I'm going through these very quickly, but if anybody has any questions, please, towards the end, just definitely um, ask me. Clears are people with dark hair, really dark hair, but eyes that don't match the hair color. In other words, there's contrast. So those eyes may be hazel, green, blue, a very light brown, but the hair and the eyes are different. Now, because their hair is dark, there is suit really, really strong, definite colors. So they do suit black, dark navy, dark charcoal, right? Black brown, they suit all of those dark colors, but not in their own. Because if they just wear that color on their own, you can't see their eyes. So if they were a dark color, they must always put a bright color with it. So of contrast here to match the contrast here. So contrast is key for these people. So if you're a guy, you could wear a dark jacket and a bright color tie, contrast. For a woman, you could go along with say a black shift dress and put a red jacket over the top of it, contrast. As long as you have contrast, the eyes will ping. But if you're only wearing one single color, make sure it's bright. The last group are the lucky ones because the shops are full of your colors and they're called soft. These are the people who have got mousy brown hair or mid brown hair and who do not tan easily. Right? They may have freckles or very pale skin and you suit faded colors. That's the way I would describe them, faded colors. Now that's been very quick. And I know it has, but I hope everybody's been able to classify yourself here to some extent. I would say uh, one thing to especially those people who color their hair. And you notice I don't say male or female anymore because it's, it's crossing right over. Lots and lots of people are coloring their hair. And it's probably the, the one area that I get most frustrated about. Because the number of times I see people with the, the wrong hair color who could look 10 times better if they simply got it right. For example, it's all to do with skin tone. Now, if you've got black skin or Asian skin, that's dead easy. Plums and purples are your are just right for you, or you keep your hair dark. But if you've got skin like mine, which tans quite easily, some people would say swarthy, that is cool skin. I don't have freckles. So my skin tans easily, so that is cool skin. So if I did have hair and was going to color it, I would only use cool colors, cool skin, cool colors. Really simple. Hence the gray beard. However, with cool skin, if I was to put red in my hair, I just look sick. And this is where I get so annoyed because you go into some of the makeup artists and they would say that my skin is cool, or sorry, is warm because it tans. It's not. It's not, it is cool. Now, for those of you with very pale skin, or who have a lot of freckles, you have warm skin. And if you have warm skin, you put warm colors in your hair. It's that simple. And keep it as basic as that. And if you do that, you'll not go far wrong. So that's the color side. Now, can we talk about style? Because fashion, is a passion of mine, always has been, all throughout my entire life. And I do fashion photography now as well, so sort of a little sideline. And when you're thinking of style, there are two rules that should never be compromised. Number one is get the color right. And number two is get the fit right. It is absolutely crucial to get the fit right because you don't want it too tight and you don't want it anything too big. So no matter what else, get the fit right. And I would say,
females really have an advantage. Females, if you're going for a job interview, think about this here. If there are 10 people in for an interview, believe it or not, the people who are remembered best are number one and number 10. The people in the middle are sort of get lost. And yet, 99% of the females who go for interviews wear dark colors. Isn't it interesting? Look around the world and you look at the world's most successful women. They all wear bright colors. If you're going for a job interview, wear color. Get away from the dark. Make yourself stand out from the crowd. Wear a good bright color. Could be a bright teal. Don't be scared of red. You know, don't be scared of going in for a job interview in red. Don't be scared. One of the, the best law brains in the world is this tiny little woman who's married to a traveler. She's got herself, you know, like, what is it? The, she, she looks tangled. And she's got this long, blonde, curly hair. She's five foot one, and she wears these outrageous pink dresses and big stiletto heels. Do you think anybody forgets about her? No. Now, she couldn't have done that at the early stages of her career, but now she can, and she is so memorable. So definitely wear a color for interviews. Guys, if you're going for interviews, if you don't have to wear a shirt and tie, I just do it as part of my brand, by the way. I don't have to do it. But if you don't have to wear a shirt and tie, wear a bright shirt or wear a shirt with color. Make you yourself stand out. If you have to go to a conservative organization, wear a bright tie. Get a tie that stands out from everybody else that's in for that interview. And guys, never wear tan shoes for an interview. Never ever wear tan shoes for an interview. Cheapens the whole look, brings you down a peg. So fit, a very simple style trick for everyone. Because I'm a big believer, frame the face. Now, if you're doing something like this here, you know, frame your face. You, you know, don't be scared to wear earrings. You know, don't be scared to wear jewelry when you're on screen because it helps frame the face. But here's something else that frames the face, your neckline. Your neckline is one of the most important things you think of in fashion. And what I mean by that, if you're trying to make your face look longer or your neck look longer, you need to wear V necklines. I mean, I have quite a roundish face, which is why I put the V here and put the tie here, because what that does, that lengthens everything here. Quite a short neck, I do a lot of training, so that makes me look like a bouncer. So I lengthen everything here. That's the same for males, females, gender neutrals, doesn't matter what, this applies to all across the board. Right? Now, if, on the other hand, I want to make my neck look shorter or my face look shorter, then, I need round necklines. I need polo necks. I need something that's going to shorten here. Shirt collars, for example, that point down the way like this here, lengthen the face. Shirt collars that go back like that, what's called a cutaway, shorten the face. So necklines are a big, big thing. Another one, and it's a massive principle in fashion and style, is scale. Whenever you're choosing anything, it should be in scale to your size. So if you're tall, then you wear bigger jewelry, larger patterns if you want to go for patterns. You carry bigger accessories. Whereas if you wear small jewelry, carry smaller accessories, have small patterns, what it does, it just makes you look bigger. If you are petite, then you do the opposite. Because if you were to wear big patterns, wear big chunky jewelry, it will make you look smaller. So for example, I am very fine boned. You can't see it, but I am. So therefore I wear fine textures. My watch is quite, you know, is, is the size for my wrist. 
even my tattoos matched my size. I didn't get anything big and grand because why? It would overpower. It's like shoes. I choose shoes to go with my scale. Scale is massive. It's the one thing that makes somebody stand out from the crowd. Because if you can see somebody who's got everything matched in properly and the scale's perfect, then you're looking at this element of detail and success. Billy, Trish has asked a question there. What about red lips? Red lips work brilliant, but the word, there's a very simple rule with it. If you're going for red lips, keep the eyes, tone the eyes down. Yeah, they go put the emphasis on the eyes, or you put the emphasis on the lips. Um, I look uh, at makeup today, and I'm going to tell you, I am learning all the time through YouTube because some of the people out there, the young people especially, are brilliant makeup. The only one thing I find criticism with is how they do their contouring. It's not subtle anymore. It's too obvious. And the, the principle behind contouring, it should be done very, so it's like blusher. Blusher, when you put it on, should never be put directly on your cheekbones because that sucks the cheekbones in. It should be put down in the bottom third of the cheekbone so that you're leaving a highlight here, which gives your face more structure. Any other questions? Uh, Trish has her hand up there. Trish, um, did you want to ask a question? Sorry, Billy. Um, it was just the red lip comment. I love a good red lip. Um, it is probably it would have been my brand when I was working, you know, um, but I also would have worn black a lot. Can you like would the red lip have been a good enough contrast for that? I just I this is blowing my mind yes. this whole part. So, you know, like the majority <laughs> of my wardrobe would have been black, very sort of monochrome black and white. Um it is that whole, you know, female professional look that you would I be going so. for. Um but for me I would have always added a red lip just as yeah, a not, as a power yeah. thing probably as well. But um it's just is that enough colour colour when you're talking about contrast or should I be adding colour to the clothes as well as a complimentary lip? I, I would complement it with the contrast in the clothes as well, Trisha. Are you a clear, by the way? I don't know, because um, between the dye on my hair and the amount of fake tan that I can put on, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what what if I was to strip it back to natural, I would be. Um, but I would tan, and I probably, my roots would come through my seat, or my seat, so. Um, right. And eye colour, what's your eye colour? Uh, a greeny hazel. Probably I would make you a cool by the sounds of it if your hair is mousy. What I would suggest that you do, instead of wearing black, if you if you like your dark colours, go for white instead. Or sorry, not white, go for navy. Navy and you just will come, you, you, the, the difference is unbelievable. I mean, if I put on a, a black waistcoat, it just drains me to put on a navy waistcoat. For some reason, it just changes completely. Um, there's a very... Locally, Linda Bryan, who used to read the news on UTV, is a cool. She, I mean, if you strip her her back, it's mousy brown. She tans easily. She's got blue eyes. She's definitely a cool. And she wore black. She always looked 10 years younger or older. When she put on navy, she looked 10 years younger. And people used to comment about it on, on you know, whenever they sent in messages to UTV. So that's the importance of this. I'm loving that because I bought a navy dress for a wedding. So, you know. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Stick a pink scarf with it as well. Trish, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for your um, question. Billy, we could get into personal consultations here very, very quickly. <laughs> uh, and I have <laughs> lots of time. I'd like to maybe throw it out there to you. Sorry, I know I'm interrupting you and you probably haven't finished, but just if there are any other questions, pop them in the, the chat box there or put your hand up so that we can try and cover um, as, as many as we can. But I'll pass back to you, Billy, because I know you probably want to finish off. Yeah, I mean, there's so much in this one area alone. Um, and I would always say to the guys, you know, unless you are tanked, in other words, you go to the gym and your shoulders are really well structured and you're going for an interview, um, then wear a jacket. And I know things have changed completely. I mean, employers used to, it's really interesting how it's changed over the, just in this last five years. It used to be they'd look for masculinity on one hand, femininity on the other hand and now we have the gender neutral um which is changing everything and I, you know i would say for the probably for the better 
But if you're not structured in the shoulder, always give yourself structure, whether you're male, female, gender neutral, give yourself that structure in the shoulders when you go in for an interview, because it gives you that little bit of authority and a bit more presence, it gives your brand that stronger look. Whereas if you go in and everything's looking a bit sloppy and down like this here, it doesn't give your brand a strong look. Can you see the questions in the chat box there, Billy? I'm not quite sure. There's one from Mary who's saying any suggestions for glasses which suit um, um, an interview or is it best to have a bright pair as well? No, you have to have glasses that suit your face. That's the, that's the bottom line with glasses. And glasses are one thing that can make or break a look. Um, your, the pupil of your eye should always be dead center from the top to the bottom, from the left to the right. Because if the pupil's not dead center, it let it make it look as if you have a turn or a squint in your eye, or it makes you look really sad. And that's how Disney, you know, whenever they're drawing cartoons and they, they want to give personalities to people, what they will do is put them in glasses and they'll put the pupil in their eye in different parts of the glass to give them different uh, appearances and different um, looks. Um, if you have a long face, always go for a wider glass. If you have a round face, go for more squarish frames. If you have a squarish face, then go for more rounded frames. Those are the basic rules of glasses. Any other questions? If somebody says bright colors advice is true, that goes for the guys too, yes. Somebody says, oh, very Chanel. <laughs> I hope this has been of use to you. Um, this one section you can see uh, could take up a full afternoon. And it's a massive area. Uh, and there's so much more I could have told you, but unfortunately, we have run out of time. Billy, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for your contribution today and for all the fantastic advice and insight that you've shared with us. Um, I'm just sharing a concluding slide um, to recommend if anybody wants to follow up on any of today's content to um, we can go back and view the recording at the end um, whenever it's been uploaded to the website and just to let you know that we have um, a range of support available to you for your career development. Um, we also want to make you aware of a range of different uh, sessions that are happening in the rest of the week. Um, tomorrow at lunchtime we have a session about the, describing the unique value you add in the workplace and I think that's actually really relevant to the continuation from the session that Billy's just led here. Um, we also have another session on Thursday about um, how we need to move from the kind of planning stages into actually taking action um, in launch and learn versus plan and perfect. And we're really excited that on Thursday afternoon, we have um, a few of the Northern Ireland women's football players who have agreed to speak to us about the, um, the amazing achievement that they've just had to qualify for the Euros next year um, and the resilience and the overcoming of challenges that they um, have shown in order to achieve that. Um, and they're going to talk from a personal perspective about how they've arrived here. Um, so we're very excited to have them speaking to us. Um, just again, just want to take this opportunity to thank Billy um, for his contribution. And um, there's a few links and um, comments in the chat there. Um, and as I say, this recording will be available afterwards. So thanks very much. Thank you, Billy. Sorry, my dog's just about to bark here, but those of you are left. <laughs>